This right here is an Intel Nook, probably the most popular and well-known mini PC line on the market today. Now, recently we've had a lot of fun checking out AMD mini PCs from the likes of B-Link and Minisform. But the last time we checked out a Intel model mini computer like this was with the B-Max PC almost two years ago. Now that computer had a Intel i5-5250U, and this Nook that we're going to be looking at today has a 12th generation Intel i5. So the question I pose, is the Intel Nook worth the near $800 price tag, or is it going to be a better bet to go with something like the GTR 6 we checked out a little bit back with the latest generation of Ryzen Mobile CPU? So before diving into some benchmarking and gaming, we must first unbox this device and take a deeper look at some of these specifications. But first, we must unbox the sponsor of today's video. Exter by far my new favorite wallet. Now, if you've seen me talk about Exter in the past, you probably know I've been using their Parliament wallets. They're traditional, classy, perfect leather stitching, and available in a bunch of colors. But I did want to go a little thinner, so I recently switched over to their Senate card holder. It fans out your cards like all the other wallets and card holders that they have, and there are places to store cash, one of their tracking devices, and some other items. The one I've been using is the Jupiter Finish, with a leather texture, but if you're looking for something a bit more industrious, you can go with their forged carbon fiber. And of course, they have other options such as wallets with a dedicated place to put an air tag, and of course, other products such as key holders, money clips, phone cases, bags, and more. Better yet, right now they are running their New Year's sale, so using the link down below or the coupon code TechHut can save you up to 40% off. So make sure you go and check out that link down below to see what they have to offer. So this right here is the box, and if we actually take off the little cover and look at the back, we can see here some of the details of what is inside, including this specific model, which is the Nook 12 WSH I-50Z. It is important to note that this is not the highest end Intel Nook out there. And opening it up here, we can see that our computer is right on top wrapped in some protective plastic. Here is the mini PC out of its packaging. And in the box, of course, we have some manuals, warranty information, stuff like that. Taking this off, it is packaged rather nicely. We do have a bracket, so you go ahead and mount it to the back of a monitor or wherever you would like. And then within the bottom of the box, we have our power, which as we can see has an output of 120 watts and then an extra HDMI and our power cables. Now back onto the mini PC. First, we're gonna take off the little top protective cover. Give it a nice peel there. It is slightly texturized and I do like this because it's not really gonna leave any fingerprints or smudges. Taking a look at the front of the computer, we have two USB 3.2 ports with one of them having power pass through, a auxiliary output and then our power button. And then flipping it onto the back, starting over here, we're gonna have our power in, we have our first HDMI, then we're gonna have our 2.5 gigabit LAN, and then we have an additional USB 3.2. Below that is a USB 2.0, and then we have our second HDMI port. One thing that I do have to say is when it comes to the actual IO here, it does seem uh, lacking for me personally. There's no USB type C's. Granted, we do have USB 3.2 the Type-C or even Thunderbolt with the Intel processor would have been nice. On the bottom here, we have a lot more information such as our power rating at 20 volts, serial numbers, models, things like that. Now this top cover here does actually pop off, but there's not really too many benefits of that. It does give you easy access to some of the screws so you can completely disassemble the thing. And maybe you can switch these out if they have more, but it's not gonna be how you're accessing the RAM storage and all that stuff. So now real quick, let's flip it over and open up the bottom and you do so with the four screws here, which are surrounded by rubber so it doesn't slide around. And they're actually pretty nice because when you unscrew them, they don't come all the way out so you're not gonna lose them, they just kinda stay there. And then once they're all unscrewed, you just go ahead and pop off the bottom. Now do be careful because the bottom has an extra spot for a 2.5 inch SSD or hard drive and it is connected with a wire so don't just unscrew it and pull it open. 
you're you're not gonna have a good time. The model I got here shipped with dual channel 16 gig per stick, so 32 gigs in total of DDR4 RAM. And like most mini PCs like this, it is very easy to go ahead and remove and upgrade it if you would like to, as it does support up to 64 gigabytes of memory. Additionally, we have a stock Intel NVMe SSD with a capacity of 512 gigabytes. On the Amazon page, it says it's rated up to 3000 megabytes a second, but according to Blackmagic, we are getting roughly half of that. And the drive does have Windows 11 Pro pre-installed, and unlike this uh, B-Link PC, the GTR 6 that we checked out earlier, I didn't need to reinstall Windows. All the drivers were there and they don't have a, a weird sketchy driver site like a B-Link seems to have. I almost forgot, probably the absolutely most important component in here is the processor. That is the Intel i5-1240P with 12 cores and 16 threads. With a base operating frequency of 2.5 gigahertz, rising up to 4.4 gigahertz in burst mode. The graphics are integrated Intel Iris Z graphics with support up to 4K and we will see how this compares to the current integrated Ryzen graphics or the Radeon graphics a little bit later. Now I did mention how there's a little spot to actually place an extra 2.5 inch hard drive and I did just that. I have another 512 gigabyte Western Digital Blue that I went ahead and threw in here. Unfortunately, even though it includes hardware and screws for the actual back mount, it doesn't have hardware for that uh, hard drive tray, which using some of the screws I already had were not big enough when it comes to the actual head of the screw, so I was kind of out of luck. So I popped the little rubber placeholders back in, kept the hard drive in there and just hoped for the best. So with it completely unboxed and ready to go, we are going to run some benchmarks. And of course we have to start with my absolute favorite test and that is Geekbench. This test had the single core score at 1612 with a multi-core score of 9391. Rather impressive for a CPU score and in line with a lot of other high powered machines such as the GTR6 which is basically within a margin of error. Granted the multi-core score performance of this Intel was a little higher as it does have more cores at 12 versus eight. Now I did run the Compute Geekbench scores since I was in Windows and this is where there was a stark difference between this Intel and the AMD GTR6 that I have. I tested both Vulkan and OpenCL and the AMD machine gets about double the score on both tests compared to this Intel machine at right around 15,000 versus right around 30,000. Actual gameplay difference wasn't as dramatic but there's definitely a difference, we'll get into that right after I talk about the other synthetic benchmark that we ran and that is Nova Bench. Nova Bench is really cool because it gives us a generic score for CPU, RAM, GPU, and disk speed. And at least with Nova Bench, the Intel Mini PC actually fell a little bit behind the AMD machine as AMD scored a 2673 while the Intel machine scored a 1993 on the CPU score. When it comes to RAM speed, this got right about 30,000 megabytes a second while the AMD machine was about 38,000 megabytes a second. The GPU score of the Intel Iris graphics gave us 371, while AMD Radeon scored a 614. And then for disk speed, Novabench ranked this about the same as Blackmagic with about uh, 1500 megabits per second read and write, while the AMD machine was at 3700 write and 2700 read. And I'll have links down below to both the Geekbench and Novabench scores of both of the machines I'm kind of comparing if you want to go a little bit deeper into more specific numbers. So now a question that we're finally gonna get to is can you use this guy right here as your gaming machine? So I loaded up a couple different games, first starting off with Fall Guys. This at 1080p mid settings had us sitting between the 50 to 60 frame per second mark and the CPU seemed to have maxed out at about 70 degrees Celsius. Overall, definitely a very playable experience. So from there, I went ahead and loaded up Call of Duty Warzone, and the range for this one was a little bigger with a high in the 30s up to about 50 frames per second, and the CPU did get a little hotter at 75, and this was all done at 1080p low settings. Now, one thing worth pointing out, I'm not sure if it was just this machine or it was just an unlucky download, but I was having some really weird graphical issues within Call of Duty. You could see I'm getting a 
like a rainbow ground effect here. It was rather distracting and that is what I am going to blame on my uh, poor performance during the test. In an attempt to throw a AAA title at this little mini PC, we loaded up Elden Ring. At 1080p, this kept us in the 20s when it comes to the frame rate and I did have the opportunity to get it up to 30 frames per second by dropping it down to 720p. And of course, all this was done at low settings. Now I did test the previous three games on that GTR 6, so if you do want to kind of see a comparison, make sure you watch that video. It will be linked right there and down below. But generally speaking, we saw about a 10 to 30 frames per second boost going to the AMD Radeon machine. So with this guy, some bonus games, I loaded up Minecraft. And with 12 chunks, fast settings at the full 1440p that my monitor is, we were at the high hundreds when it comes to frame rates. And then jumping into settings and changing everything, including the render distance to the highest possible, we still were sitting at a, around a comfortable 60 frames per second. Granted, doing this did have our CPU absolutely cooking at 80 degrees Celsius. And just for fun, I went ahead and loaded up a good old PlayStation 2 emulator as an excuse to play some Jack 2. And running this emulator was actually kind of interesting because instead of relying on the uh, GPU, like a lot of the other games, it was very CPU dependent, which it did result in the clock speeds actually turbo boosting up to the possible 4.4 gigahertz. And you could see the overall CPU usage is rather low. And this did actually result in cooler overall temperatures at about 60 degrees Celsius while we were locked in at about 60 frames per second the entire time. So overall, to be quite frank, is this the best bang for your buck? I would have to say probably not. And some of the things that we've done today, I don't even think is really the best use case for this. Personally, one with Intel, the amount of cores that we have, the 12 cores available to us, I think that this would probably suit you best as a wonderful little home lab Proxmox server type situation. You got 2.5 gigabit, you have the extra room where you can fit a huge 2.5 inch hard drive in there. I'd much rather use this guy over the GTR 6 in a home lab server type environment any day but I would much rather use that GTR 6 as my daily driver desktop computer, which I've been doing. And plus it's an Intel licensed machine versus a random like Chinese company. So that is also something to highly consider. Now with that, please let me know down below what you think of this versus other mini PC options on the market today. And if you're interested in learning about some of those other options, again, of course, I'll be linking down below and I'll actually be linking right here. So you might as well click that right there. Just give it a click. Have a great day.